Little Novels by Wilkie Collins, a series of five short stories dramatized by John Arden, with Ronald Pickup as Wilkie Collins. Number one, Mr. Policeman and the Cook. There was a man called Wilkie Collins. I was a man called Wilkie Collins. Queer little fellow, so they said. Contriver of sensational stories. Earned a quantity of money. Ate rich and unsuitable foods. Kept two irregular wives at the same time. My life was happy. Was. No, I'm not dead yet. But soon, so very soon, already it is 1881, already I'm nearly 60 years old. I've not been at all well, indeed extremely ill. Rheumatic gout, they call it. Unbelievable surges of pain. I flood myself with liquid opium, continually increasing doses. I go mad if I don't have it. So the pain for an hour or two subsides. Cumulative process. Can't go on forever. I know no other way to spur the imagination to write. My imagination... All the drugs imagination. I sit and see these hundreds of unmanageable notions for new stories. Full-length novels. Oh, God, I've no time to write novels. And yet they obsess me. Take an instance. Who is this man who has just now appeared moaning and groaning at the bottom of my glass? This simulacrum of a human being on the very brink of death. Eaten up, I would guess, by incurable cancer. He does not dare to die until his secret is revealed. The brink of death and no time left to him. No, he's not me. Not at all me. He's a degraded, squalid creature. He's not been to church for a quarter of a century. Yet now... Uh. Do you hear him crying for a Roman Catholic priest? Uh, Get a priest! For God's sake, fetch me a priest! And a priest conscientiously comes... Mr Brady? ...to a grimy attic room in a London back street, Bethnal Green, perhaps, where the dying man babbles amid a rat's nest of tumbled bedclothes. Bless me, Father, for I have sinned. Oh, Father, I have sinned, most grievously sinned. Who could he be? I I know he used to be a policeman. A blue bottle, bobby, peeler, rosser, copper, crusher, trap. The hell with it, on the beat. Do you know what I mean? Do you know? Now the opium shows him to be as he once was, young, fresh-faced in all the stiffness of his uniform, the essential guarantor of our national respectability, and yet full to the brim with every grotesque nightmare to afflict the imagination of the age, by virtue of his duty in continual possession of other people's secrets. And now, nearly half a lifetime later, this derelict blue bottle is still in possession. Somebody's secret became his secret. Secret. Yes, he has kept it within him, absolutely inside of himself, and of course it has destroyed him. Uh, uh, My son, uh, I insist. Uh, I insist we must uh, take it in order. Uh, Keep your mind first upon sins of dishonesty. Yes. Very well, yes. then. How many? How many? So many. So many years since I said my last confession. Since I left the police. So many little jobs. Commissioner, office messenger, bookies runner. Street porter. Down I went. Down. Yes, but dishonesty. It'd stick to me fingers, you see. Cash. Top and sixpence. The drink. The cards. And the... And the... I ought to have told him. Should have said about the murder. Ought to have reported it. Couldn't. Didn't. Oh, Father, I stole. I stole a pair of boots. Murder? You said... 
Murder? Out in all weathers? How could I work without Stop! Boots? Not a word more. You're trying to confuse me with your boots. You cannot confuse God. Oh, my dear son, do you tell me you killed someone? No. No, no, no. I never, but I never. Look, it was this way. Do you see what I mean? So long, long ago... Trying only to tell without evasion, yet incorrigibly evasive, he rambles through his tale and at last reaches some sort of an end to it. There. That was it. That's all I have to tell. But I ought to have reported. Do you know what I mean? I mean, told it there and then. Let me see. Have I the gist of it? You were an honourable public servant in a publicly responsible force. You yourself all the more responsible in that you are a Catholic, a religion so disliked and scorned by so many English people. And then you abandoned your uniform. You abandoned, moreover, one huge responsibility your service had imposed upon you. It's been eating at your conscience ever since. Now, to demonstrate sincerely a proper repentance, I'm sure you'll comprehend, your fault must be made as public as once was your uniform, your blue coat, your bright buttons, remember? The truncheon, the helmet. It was tall hats in them days, Father. We used You're to. You're confusing it again. Hat, helmet, nonsense. You know what must be done. You and I, between us, will arrange your full story in order. As we do so, I will write it down. You shall put your name to it. And then we send it in to the authorities. Oh, no. For that'll... That'll incriminate... Incriminate another person. Yes, perhaps it will. You must both take your chance of it. The hand of God will dispose the event. By sending for me, you have deliberately chosen to place yourself within that immeasurably merciful hand. The doctor said I'm dead by the end of the month. Maybe sooner. Maybe tonight. The dead man's statement, uncorroborated... They could never stand it up sufficient to make a charge. So maybe, maybe nobody will take upon themselves to act on it. Except God. That's what matters. He's the chance, isn't he, Father? So, pen, ink, paper, you have them, I suppose? Pencil and me rent book. Somewhere on the mantelpiece, can you find it? Write it in that. Right. I'll come clean. Officer, I'll come clean. Me with the notebook in them days. Me with the pencil, right? Very well. Right then. Here we go. When I was a young man of five and twenty, I, Cornelius Brady, became a member of the London Police Force. It was nearly two years before I found myself granted the immense opportunity of helping to inquire into a most serious and terrible crime. So now, if this were the 600-page novel it ought to be but cannot be, I'd commence to lay out every circumstance of the murder. A police station in North London. Four o'clock on a Tuesday morning. I was on night duty. I'd describe every witness, every suspect, in such detail as to provide them with at least a chapter apiece and, and a room-by-room -room description of the scene of the crime, a lower-middle-class lodging house between the Angel and Clerkenwell Road. It belonged to a Mrs. Cross Cable. It was her cook, Priscilla Thorlby, that sprang into the station house all of a frantic hurry, four in the morning, out of the dark and the rain. Is this the station house? Can't you see that it is? That's the inspector in charge, a hot-tempered man. What's the matter now? He snarls at her. And she burst out, murder's the matter. Murder! murder. For God's sake, come back with me. A young woman has murdered her husband in the night. With a knife, sir, a knife. She says she thinks she did it in her sleep. Nice looking, this Priscilla. Even in her terrified condition, just out of bed with her clothes huddled on anyhow. I was partial to a tall figure. She was, as they say, my style. Of course, the bare bones of it can be told in two pages, which is how I'll have to tell them. The crucial point about this murder, it is Constable Brady, who is there and then sent off to carry out the first inquiries, his inspector thinking it high time to put him to the test on a job of some significance. He's to examine the blood-soaked premises to find if indeed they are blood-soaked or... Is the nice-looking, tall and terrified Priscilla a drunkard, a madwoman, or the maker of a mischievous hoax? Hoax? She resented that, and who wouldn't? At least that's what I thought as I walked along the street with her. 
What did he mean, hoax? Who is he, anyway? Lord High and Mighty Inspector, that's who. Let me tell you, miss, he'd no right to treat you like that. I don't care who hears me say so. I wish he was as frightened as I am. Oh, sir, the sight of that blood. This is the first time I've been in service, sir, away from home. I did think I'd found a respectable place. I didn't say much more to her. Truth be told, I was feeling anxious about the duty committed to me. Because I was trusted. And that was so important for me. Me being so young and ambitious, don't you see? I was trusted to take names and preliminary statements off of all potential witnesses. Or, for that matter, suspects. It being a lodging house, the establishment was full of them. Let's say the dead man has his room on the second floor. Yeah. His name is John Zebedee. He's staying there with his wife. Immediately opposite, across the landing, is a Mr... or Monsieur de Luc, an agent for a cigar company from the French West Indies, it's supposed to be a Creole, which would mean, in police terms, a touch of the tar brush, perhaps, which would mean he's an obvious suspect, except that Mrs. Zebedee appears to have confessed. The problem was, Father... Could anyone believe her? At three in the morning, the landlady had found her screaming on the bedroom landing, and this foreigner, De Luc, in great alarm, trying to quiet her, for he too had been woke by her screams. Or oh, so he says, My dear John's been murdered! She's crying out at the top of her voice, I'm the miserable wretch, I did it in my sleep! So foreigner and landlady go into the Zebedee's bedroom, and there they discover the corpse. On his back, in his bed... Dead. Blood everywhere. Of course, this story must be sensational. But for young Brady, the true horror is... The sight of his poor little wife. Only just married they were. Oh, but my heart went out to her. I could not persuade myself she was guilty. And then, when I found the requisite, uh, what we call, clues, and reported them to the inspector, it was all very queer, but... Clue number one, the book she's been reading before she went to sleep. A medical book. The World of Sleep, open at a page that told all about a sleepwalker who dreamt of a violent fight and awoke to find he'd stabbed his own wife. Clue number two. The weapon. Still in the wound, thick, sticky with blood, blood everywhere. How it had spurted. <laughs> I had to force myself to wipe it, to look at it carefully. A clasp knife, expensive, engraved with uh, just half an inscription. It said, to John Zebedee from. From a blank, that's all it says. Mysterious indeed. But it must be his own knife, and who else could have got at it but his wife? For discovering these clues, I was commended by the inspector. And yet... Commended? Zeal, drive, ambition. And yet... Incredible contradiction. Yet who could believe that what Mrs Zebedee believed was the truth? When she was able to speak, she admitted, fair enough, she'd been reading the world of sleep. And when she awoke to discover her husband dead, she put two and two together. But where had she found the knife, eh? She swore she'd never seen it before. Never? And she insists that she used it involuntarily to stab him. Incredible, electrifying, <laughs> exhilarating contradiction. It made no sense at all. Likewise, no sense in laying charges against her, so therefore none was laid. A reward of a hundred quid offered for information, particularly among the cutlery trade, to try to find out more about the knife. But nothing. Dead end. My superiors decided to drop the case, but even, even so... Even so, our Cornelius Brady is a very sharp young chap, and he hasn't liked the look of that Dago cigar merchant, De Luc, one little bit. On the other hand, Priscilla, the cook... Fact is, I more than liked her. To tell the truth, I... Uh, I first knew what love was, thanks to Priscilla... I had delicious kisses, thanks to Priscilla. I met with her every chance I could get. I told myself, of course, it was all for the purpose of finding more clues to, to the crime. And let me tell you, in the midst of all else, she was indeed giving me clues. 
But please, Mr. Brady, I, I don't understand. If, as you say... Oh, Priscilla, my dear, I beg you, don't call me Mr. Brady. Until I am quite sure, Cornelius, where we stand to each other, I think Mr. Brady would be best. For it's as I said yesterday, how can two such poor people as we are ever hope to get married? And I said to you, my love, of course we can get married. Just as soon as I lay my hand on the clue that the inspector's not been able to find. Immediate promotion. They couldn't fail to let me have it. But that's what I don't understand. If, as you say, it all points to that wife of his, then she didn't mean to do it. And nobody's blaming her. Isn't that the kindest way? I mean, let well alone, Corny. Live and let live. Hmm? Let's just sit on this seat here and listen to the band for a bit and forget all these horrid, nasty nightmares. Hold my hand, Corny. Tight. So it's not Mr. Brady after all. It will be if you try to take liberties. You know you wouldn't dare if you were wearing your uniform. If I was wearing my uniform, I would question you very rigorous about everything you've ever heard about that chap from the West Indies. Oh, well, if you think it's still Mr. Monsieur Greasy de Luc you're investigating, I don't mind letting you know what the housemaid last night declared that she saw only a day or two before Mr. Zebedee was killed. What? This is brand new. Quick, tell me. Tell! Brand new, highly suggestive. Monsieur de Luc had intercepted Mrs. Zebedee on the stairs, had his arm round her waist and was fiercely attempting to kiss her. Did she resist? She did more. She slapped his face and said if he tried it again, she'd go straight and tell her husband. And then he said... Ah, madame, zit, says he. You may live to regret this. <laughs> Suggestive, ambiguous. And, of course, we bear in mind that the day or two, as mentioned, gives our suspect plenty of time to buy a knife and get it inscribed. Once again, it all depends upon the provenance, as we term it, of that unaccountable clasp knife, damn it to hell. Apologies for language, but I'm just that frustrated I could... Oh, Corny, dear, in my opinion, you'll never, ever find any trace of the knife. How could you? It could have come from anywhere. But, Corny, when I tell you that the housemaid had had her own little dust-up with Monsieur de Luc, and that he hadn't been above putting his hands towards me where he shouldn't. What? Don't you think, then, that if you and that inspector of yours was to look up his record all over London and then question him night and day, well, he's not an innocent man, Corny. If you can only find out exactly what he did and how, then there's your promotion, Corny. Safe and sound and signed on the line. And, Corny lovey, you and me be man and wife as soon as we want it. So there I was, father, a promised husband. That's to say, give or take the imminent colour of that goat of a tobacco tout, which now in my own mind I was counting as quite certain. It seemed to be only right that I should be made known to Priscilla's parents. They lived in a village in Dorset. She'd worked there as a servant before she came to try her luck in London. And so that's how it was. That's how the full, gruesome truth was all to come out at me. Waterloo Station. He never knew what he meant when he said it. He said... Who said? The booking clerk. Who else? He said, if you take the 11.15, there'll be five minutes' wait at Waterbank Junction, but you don't have to change. Five minutes' wait. Enough for what she wanted. Corny, this is Waterbank. Oh, Corny, I'm that thirsty. Uh, five minutes, did you say? Oh, do be a dear and run to the refreshment room. Fetch me a bottle of soda water. Twenty times enough to tear my life to pieces. Five minutes. Do it easy. <sighs> of course I didn't do it easy. Bottle of soda pop, please, miss. Quick as you can, please. I'd only just got served when... The damn train went off and left me all standing. We got a full half hour until the next one came in. So, what to do? Up one street, down the other street of that dreary little town. In the second street, a shop with its shutters closed. Why, it caught my attention. The shop has closed down premises to let. The name over the premises is James Wickham Cutler. 
even in me off-duty playing clothes, I still carried a copy of the photograph we'd had taken of that clasp knife. Maybe James Wickham, if already going out of business, had never received the original inquiry. I had twenty minutes in hand, worth trying. Oh, yes. A very old man, very dirty, very deaf. Holding up an ear trumpet. Mr. Wickham is dead. If you want to buy the business, go upstairs to his brother-in-law. The brother-in-law was Mr. Scorrier, who had done all Mr. Wickham's engraving and inscription work. No better man to ask, so I asked. And he said... Looking first very carefully at the photograph through a magnifying glass, he says... This is curious, yes... My memory is failing me, but I do remember this name. Queer name. Zebedee. Yes, sir. I did the engraving as far as it goes. I wonder what it was now that prevented me finishing it. You've never heard the name otherwise? You've never heard it mentioned since? Do you not read the newspapers? Oh, no, he said. Never. My eyesight is failing me. I abstain, sir, from reading in the interests of my occupation. Notwithstanding, he and his brother-in-law had not abstained from keeping a record of all the transactions, thank God. Thank God! If I was to say, curse God! But you don't say it. No, no, no! Not any more, not now. I have said it often enough. For there was the engraver. He was looking up his ledger. He found the full wording of the inscription that had been ordered. It read... To John Zebedee from Priscilla Thurlby. She'd bought the knife at this very shop. She'd left it in with the man Scorrier to have the writing put on it. And then, the next day... Now it all comes back to me, explains the man Scorrier. She burst in in a state of frenzy and snatched the knife away when I'd only got half of it done. I terrify that man Scorrier. I roared out I was a policeman. I summon you to assist me in the discovery of a crime. I must have that page from your ledger. I didn't take the train that had catch me up with Priscilla but the next one back to London. Nor did I go home. I found a bed at a public house. I couldn't bear that she should find me that I might turn murderer and kill her there and then. Father, I decided to resign my situation in the police. Why? Because neither could I bear to bring her to justice. But I did write a letter to the clergyman in Dorset, who I knew had recommended her for her job at Mrs. Cross Cables. I wrote to him that I was Priscilla's affianced, And would he kindly tell me, in consideration of my position, what were her former relations with the person named John Zebedee? He replied by return of post. A thoroughly clerical, conscientious, well-intended, interfering communication. Sir, under the circumstances, I think I am bound to tell you confidentially, Zebedee was in service in this neighbourhood. A vicious and heartless wretch, he tried to seduce Priscilla under promise of marriage. Her virtue resisted him. He pretended to be ashamed of himself. The bans were published in my church, and on the next day he cruelly deserted her. Be assured, you're about to unite yourself to an excellent girl and accept my best wishes, etc., etc., lest it be supposed that I too had cruelly deserted her without giving her any sort of reason. I went to her for the last time. She was at work in Mrs. Cross Cable's kitchen. I slipped in at the back entry without knocking. For a moment, she didn't see me. When she did, she turned red with rage. You! My God! All this time you leave me without one single word. Single and now you word? dare to come back here. I have just this to say to you and then after it. No words. Never. No words again. Priscilla, I have been to the cutler's shop at Waterbank. Her eyes were fixed and staring like a person in a fit. Words you want. Words. With one word I could hang you. God forgive me. I can't say it.
I never saw her again, but she wrote me a letter. When I die soon, so very soon, that letter will be my last recollection on earth. She wrote how she'd bought the knife as a keepsake. I bought the knife as a keepsake for John Zebedee and left it to be engraved, and that was the day he deserted me. I snatched the knife back from the engraver. I fled from that district. I came at last to work in London. And then, who was it arrived as a lodger in the house? But him and his new married bride. I kept in the kitchen. He never set eyes on me. And then the devil entered me. In the deep of the night, I crept into their bedroom. I saw them both asleep. I had the knife in my hand. I saw what the book was she'd been reading. The thought came to do it then. And so they'd hang her for the murder. And then afterwards, the thought came, maybe if not her, the cigar merchant. And afterwards again, another thought. If you found out, how could you hang your own wife? Mind this, though. Mind this. She wrote I was to mind that she did really like me. It wasn't just the fact you were so proud and ambitious you might very well get at the truth. I am a penitent sinner. But just what was the sin? Failure to do my duty? Or ambition to do too much duty? Because in the end, to keep my mouth shut, oh, to be sure, on a matter of murder, why, that seemed to me to be the only duty left. (coughs) Father, can you give me an answer? Now, of course he can't, or put it this way, I haven't got an answer for him to give. The secret is revealed even at the brink of death, but that's not to say it's going to explain itself. (laughs) Ah, God, between pain and opiate, I've neither time nor patience. This story is worn out. If I can drink enough of the drug to cause me to fall asleep, I might dream of another one. In Mr. Policeman and the Cook by Wilkie Collins, dramatised by John Arden, Ronald Pickup was Wilkie Collins, John Quinn, Constable Brady, Rachel Atkins, Priscilla, and Hugh Dixon, the Priest. The pianist was Colin Guthrie. The director was David Blount.